Hello, Mark. Hi there, Rupert. Um, today, as a, a part of our ongoing series of discussions, um, I wanted to talk about end of life experiences in animals. This may seem a surprising topic, but the reason I'm interested in it is that um, I've been interested for a long time, but we've just had a paper come out, uh, co-authored by uh, with my assistant, Pam Smart, who's worked with me for many years, and Michael Nam, uh, in the, uh, who works in Freiburg in Germany. And so this is our paper that's just come out in the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Experiences of dying animals, parallels with end of life experiences in humans. And, and this is part of a research uh, area that's been growing in recent years, study of end of life experiences, what happens when people are, are near death. Now, there's been an interest for many years in near death experiences, and there's been a huge literature on this, the experiences of people who almost die and experience themselves going out of their bodies. Um, they often find themselves looking down on themselves, going through a kind of tunnel into a realm of peace and joy where they often meet deceased relatives or loved ones or beings of light. And then, of course, they have to come back because it's only a near-death experience. Well, that's one feature of uh, end-of-life experiences, or that's near end-of-life or experiences. It's not actually end-of-life because it's only near death, they come back. But there's also been uh, studies on other aspects of people nearing the end of their life. And one of the most striking findings, uh, which has been named by Michael Nam, my colleague, um, as terminal lucidity, is the way in which some people who have had dementia or who've been otherwise severely disabled, soon before they die, um, become really clear. They know who people are, they remember things that they've apparently forgotten for years, uh, they become com present, completely present. And my interest in this uh, was triggered really by the experience with my own brother, Andrew, who died a couple of years ago, having had several years of severe dementia. Um, and when I visited him in, in that state, he really couldn't say much. He didn't talk much. He, he didn't really know what was going on. Um, but I visited him just very soon before he died. And it was completely different experience. He was totally present. He looked me in the eyes. I felt this immediate connection. I mean, the stronger connection than I felt probably since we were children. Um, and I knew something extraordinary had happened. And it was a remarkable experience for me, and I think for him. And shortly afterwards, he died. So this made it a personal matter for me, learning more about uh, terminal lucidity. and. It's interesting for several reasons. One is uh, it enables people to say goodbye uh, who their families may have given up on in, in terms of being able to communicate. Um, and secondly, from a theoretical point of view, it's very interesting because if people's memories have, if they've lost their memories, uh, the usual assumption is that the brain degeneration that occurs in Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia um, has wiped out the memories, which are usually assumed to be stored in the brain. But if they can have this uh, recovery of memory, it shows the memories weren't wiped out, that uh, what may have been wiped out was the ability to retrieve the memories, and that somehow comes back for unknown reasons. So that's uh, uh, interesting from a theoretical point of view. I, I myself don't think memories are stored in the brain, but given by morphic resonance, as you know. So. Um, now, what happened then is that uh, I have a large database of stories about animals, more than 6,000 case histories. People write in with these stories, and my associate Pam Smart classifies them, and we have dozens of categories, and we have all these stories on our database. And 
over the years, we have a category for end of life experiences, and I hadn't paid much attention to it. But when I looked at it, I found that we had over 100 cases that have accumulated. And looking through them, there are remarkable parallels uh, to end of life experiences with humans. Um, one of the features of end of life experiences is a surge of energy, sometimes called the last rally. Um, in the 19th century literature, it's called the last rally. Uh, sometimes people working in hospices or nurses use that term today. Um, in Spanish, they have a term for this, la mejoría de la muerte, the improvement of death. Um, so there are various terms for this uh, in humans, uh, but something similar seems to be happening in animals. And we found uh, a number of categories of animal behavior uh, in dying animals reported by their owners or by vets, uh, which are strikingly parallel to the similar things in humans, like the last rally. And one um, uh, striking feature, which we have quite a number of examples of, is called the last goodbye. I'll just read one example, or maybe two examples. Um, and these are mostly with dogs and cats. There are some of these stories are with parrots, some are with horses and other animals. Here's one um, about a dog. A few years ago, our Staffordshire Bulldog, Petey, fell terminally ill. One hour before he died, he came to each member of the family and spent a little time with everybody, one at a time. We thought this behavior was odd, as he didn't usually do this, uh, at least not to each individual person at one time. He seemed alive and much more energetic than he had been uh, than than he had been being so ill. After spending a bit of time with each of us, he made his way downstairs to his bed and died peacefully. And here's another one. This is the sad but true story of what our family experienced with our dog Foxy. We all loved the dog because it was so friendly, devoted and loyal as well as very watchful and clever. When the dog became old, it could not hear so well anymore. It could not hear so well anymore. Um, ate less and became weak. Finally, at the age of 14, it could hardly move from its resting place. Then one day the following happened. The whole family sat at the dinner table when the good dog struggled to its feet went around from one to the next, sadly looked at everybody, gave paws to each member of the family, then it trudged back, slowly lay down and died. You can believe me, we had tears in our eyes after this goodbye scene. The dog had felt the end and pulled itself together for a final goodbye to all of us. So um, there's this ability that um, animals seem to have, firstly, to know when they're about to die, and secondly, to have a surge of energy, um, mental energy and physical energy, um, uh, which seems to be part of the dying process. And why we think this is interesting in the animal cases is they're so similar to the human cases. Previously, people thought this was just a feature of human dying. Um, but the fact it happens with so many animals, non-human animals, suggests that there's some biological basis for this, that dying animals may feel uh, different. Uh, there may be a change in physiology just shortly before death, um, that a deep-seated biological feature. And we've, in our stories, we have it in both mammals and birds. I don't know about reptiles and fish, but at least with the examples we have are from mammals and birds. It may be something quite deep and biological, and human end-of-life experiences uh, fit into that general pattern. So that's what I wanted to bring up today. Yes, yeah, so maybe just the, um, an initial thought is that um, in the case of, of human beings, this is something that's personal to me as well, because um, my mother um, died um, too young of a cancer, and so whilst it wasn't um, a brain disease um, that killed her, um, she was um, unconscious, essentially, for the last um, day or more of her life. 
Um, and um, one of my family members, um, we all gathered um, on her last day, and one of my family members couldn't stay um, because of commitments with her children. And um, we weren't sure, you know, when my mother would die, of course. Um, and my mother had been unconscious um, for many hours by this stage. And um, so my sister went to her, um, you know, the bedside um, to hold her hand and make her personal goodbye. But in that moment, my mother woke up, um, sat up um, and said, it's OK, you can go now. Um, and so let my sister go. And it was and then and then, um, you know, quite quickly became unconscious again um, and then died actually a few hours later. Um, so it was a very remarkable moment um, in the dying process of my mother as well. Um, and I know also that um, some of the big palliative care charities um, that particularly look after um, people who have terminal conditions, um, they are actively researching, actually, um, this phenomenon because they want to make sure that the care they offer, particularly when it comes to medication, um, doesn't sort of overwrite um, the possibility of these last goodbyes, these rallies. Um, it's very, very widely recognised amongst nurses and others that look after people um, in um, the, the hours, days before they die. Um, so this is, you know, something which um, is actually um, widely known, I think, in this whole area. Um, and it's great that um, people are starting to actively think about it um, because, you know, there has been a tendency to just medicalise the last hours of death and before death. Um, and, you know, this, with perfectly good reason and, and the desire to care, um, but to try and get it right so that you don't um, miss what can be very powerful and healing moments for all concerned is really important. Yes. Well, uh, interesting, isn't it, that the, the people in the hospice movement who uh, on a regular basis are dealing with people dying are uh, really paying attention to this. Thank goodness they are. That's, um, I mean, I think there are two things that come out of this <coughs> research that might be relevant to actual practice. One is this lucidity that comes to people when they're nearly dying and the last goodbyes. I mean, one of, with these animals, one of the major things, themes that shines through these cases is how many of them, the animals want to say a last goodbye. But it's it's remarkable. They, they like these examples I read. It, it's quite clearly a kind of last goodbye. And there, we have examples with cats where they go around the members of the family, sit in their lap for a few minutes, and then move to the next one. And it's clearly saying goodbye. Um, well, in 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 hospice situation where there's uh, where they use opioids like morphine to reduce the pain of dying, I suppose one danger is that if people are over medicated, then this lucidity that comes before death may be masked or even suppressed by the powerful effects of these these drugs. And, and so I suppose that one of the things is to strike the right balance so that there's enough medication to prevent unnecessary pain, and, but not too much to prevent these very important uh, uh, abilities to be clearer just before dying and to say goodbye. Um, and another theme that emerges from these stories is that, uh, that one of the themes that uh, we identified in these stories was retreating into solitude. There's uh, particularly cats, um, uh, when they're about to die, seem to have, some of them seem to have an urge to retreat into solitude to go into the garden to hide in some bushes and die there away from the house. Um, and I suspect that that may be a pattern with quite a number of wild animals. Um, if a wild animal is dying in the nest or, or the den or whatever, um, it would be a problem for the others after it's died. They'd have to remove a dead body which might otherwise decay and spoil their normal resting place and so on. And so for evolutionary reasons, it's possible that animals um, go away to die, uh, retreat into solitude and die away from the others. Um, and this is something that some dogs and, and quite a number of cats seem to want to do. They often don't have the chance because they're in 
indoors and they, they can't get out. Um, but there's also among dying people, there are quite a number of stories about people who are dying and the family around them and everyone's around them and uh, all the nurses are in the room and stuff. And then when people have left the room, maybe to go to the toilet or for a meeting or some with a doctor or something, the people die then when they're alone. And it could be that there, for some people at least, there is, there's a basic urge to die alone, which it may be deeply instinctive and coming from our animal heritage, um, you know, going off into solitude to die, rather than the Victorian deathbed scene with absolutely everyone around the bed and sort of enormous social event death. Um, for some people, it may be preferable to do it alone. Um, because there are certain things people prefer doing alone. And um, I don't know enough about it because I haven't worked in hospices and things to know how common this is. But it's certainly something that studying these animal cases made me much more aware of. And it, so it may not be appropriate for absolutely everyone to have constant company while they're dying. They may want to have moments when they can be alone. And so, yeah, there's a couple of thoughts. There. I mean, I think certainly it's anecdotal, but um, from my own uh, uh, knowledge of, of what happens in hospices and around care, um, it's very common, again, to hear stories of um, people who said their goodbye, the relatives left, thinking they'd be back in the morning, say, and then um, the, the person dies alone overnight or um, quite quickly, you know, after the departure of their relatives. Um, and so that would resonate with what you're saying there. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is a, a, maybe complementing um, the deep evolutionary side of it. I wonder, too, whether people, as they approach death, as it were, the veil between this life and what happens next becomes much thinner. And people are already beginning to move into the space of what comes next. Um, certainly, you know, with near-death experiences, um, it's very common to hear of people who have had these experiences, maybe going through the tunnel, being in places of peace and joy, and then being told, no, now is not their time. And so they must come back. Um, and certainly um, the idea that um, the veil between life and death, sometimes, um, you know, with working with with much older people, um, even if they aren't ill, there's a sense that actually they're kind of living in between zones, in fact. Um, and so they feel the pull of what happens next quite as much as the sense of, of, of their mortal lives. Um, and, you know, that can even be painful for relatives because um, they feel like they're losing the person. But actually what's happening, certainly as people have described it, um, is that they're realizing that life um, is bigger than just their mortal life um, and they're feeling the transition to that wider life. Um, and so um, what looks like a desire to be alone could also be um, the stepping into this wider life, which of course is, is leaving um, mortal life behind, um, you know, as the people who have the near-death experiences would describe it. Um, yeah, so, you know, maybe there's complementing the evolutionary, maybe more sort of practical side. Um, there is also... A hint there of uh, of of what comes, what follows um, on the other side of death, and um, that people um, start to experience even before they've died. Well, that seems to be the case, as you say, with people who work in hospices and who've seen a lot of people die. And this is something Peter and Elizabeth Fenwick write about in their book on the art of dying. Uh, Peter Fenwick, who is the president of the Scientific and Medical Network, who's a psychiatrist and who spent many years together with his wife, Elizabeth, studying death and phenomena related to death and deathbed situations, um, says that in, many people when they're dying seem to be seeing visions or sometimes even talk to people who aren't there, like dead relatives, as if they're already opening up to another realm of conscious experience that's associated with dying or death or beyond death. Um, 
and some seem blissfully happy and joyful and sometimes this joy spreads to those around them uh, as if they're anticipating a kind of post-mortal uh, altered state of consciousness um, so that does seem to be a, a, a quite a general pattern um, and it relates to another phenomenon which is being researched at the moment uh, with people and which I and my colleagues are doing something about with animals at the moment, which is the so-called literature on after-death contacts. Um, about 50% of people who are bereaved who've had a long-term relationship, for example, married people who've lost a husband or a wife, um, have the experience of a contact with the person after they've died. I'm not now referring to going to spirit mediums and and who then channel the dead person, but spontaneous events when they either see uh, once or more the, the person who's died as a, a kind of apparition, they just appear, um, or smell them, sometimes the smell of characteristic tobacco or perfume or something, or hear them, hear their voice, or feel their presence, you know, in, in bed and suddenly feel they're being hugged by um, their dead uh, spurs. Um, and for most people who've had these after death contacts, it's enormously reassuring. Uh, most people uh, deal with the bereavement process better after these uh, contacts. And when this was first noticed or written about in about 20 years ago by a Welsh doctor who uh, called Rees, who uh, some of his patients told him about this and he then made a point of asking bereaved patients uh, about it and most people didn't talk about it most of them said they'd never told anyone because they didn't want to be thought mad or schizophrenic or schizophrenic or hearing voices or seeing apparitions they thought this would these would be treated as symptoms of madness so most people were relieved to be able to talk about it because they hadn't been able to talk about it before and he found about 50% of bereaved people had had this experience. And subsequent work on after-death contacts has shown, yes, it is indeed um, really quite common. Um, and uh, I mean, this has lots of implications. I mean, you could say these are just hallucinations based on memories of the person and they're comforting to the people who've had them because it's all produced inside their head as hallucinations. Uh, and that's obviously what the skeptics, materialists and atheists are going to say. Um, but that's not how it seems to people who experience these things. And it does have a, a powerful effect for them. What we found is looking at these cases with animals, very similar things happen uh, with beloved dogs, cats or other animals. Um, people see them, feel their presence. Uh, for example, with cats, one of the more common phenomena is that the deceased cat has gone, and the, the, but it's a cat that normally would have jumped up on somebody's bed and sort of in the morning and snuggled up with them. Um, and people feel the cat jump up onto the bed. And of course, it's not really the cat. It's a kind of phantasm of the deceased cat. But um, this feeling of animals or seeing them uh, again, very similar things happen uh, with animals as they do with people. Uh, we're going through this at the moment. We're planning to write a paper on this subject as a sequel to our one on end of life experiences. Um, so I think this is a, a, a very interesting area of research, which until recently was more or less ignored. Um, but now that it's been given a name after death contacts, just like near-death experiences had always been going on but once it's given a name uh, it's easier to talk about it and terminal lucidity uh, no doubt has always gone on but once it's got a name it's easier to identify the phenomenon and giving this the name of after-death contacts enables us to see the phenomenon more clearly clearly yeah no i think i can understand that and it as you're talking it reminds me of one of the best books to date that I think has been written on this by the journalist Leslie Keane called Surviving Death. And actually it was also turned into a Netflix series. And she looks at various types of contact um, with people who have died. 
um, from accounts of reincarnation through near-death experiences, uh, mediumship, um, and and also um, after-death contact. Um, and um, she kind of says there's loads of anecdotal evidence, even good studies. Um, she she feels that mediumship is much harder to assess because it so very substantially varies the quality of the mediumship. Um, whereas things like near death experiences and even after death encounters, um, they're much better cases because you can quantify and qualify um, what happens much more clearly. Um, but one of the things which she concludes is that um, there are always alternative explanations. And I wonder particularly um, what you make of this in, in your work, because one of the possibilities is that it's actually memories returning to the person um, and maybe, you know, memories that are reenacted in the case of the sense of someone's die being present, um, you know, the hug in the bed or the smell and so on. Um, this may not be um, indicative of, of them um, on the other side communicating, but maybe just a very, well, I say just, maybe a powerful memory um, of that person that, for example, could be held within a morphic field if memories aren't held in the brain um, you know maybe that that these kind of fields have a dynamism of their own um, and that that is what the person is experiencing after someone has died and so I wonder whether you um, have thought about how to you know tease out um, these possible explanations and whether the evidence um, you gather gives any indicators um, on that front. Well, I mean, the, the memory hypothesis is obviously is a fairly straightforward one. And um, I think it would be rather hard to tell. Uh, I mean, there's certainly the people who experience these things don't think it's just some kind of memory flashback. They feel there's a real presence, uh, they're, they're, they're a sense of presence, and that is very comforting. Now, the fact it's comforting doesn't necessarily prove anything one way or the other. Um, and uh, so one has to leave it open, I think. I mean, I can't, we, we're just starting this research, so I haven't read through all these cases yet. We have well over 100 in our collection. So, um, you know, the, there may be some that will enable us to shed a light on that. Um, but in terms of alternative explanations, um, I think one of the most radical implications of this is religious. Um, and I'm thinking here of the uh, resurrection of Jesus. What happens in, in after the crucifixion and the resurrection, which is such a central part of Christianity, um, is that disciples and people who were very close to Jesus, St. Mary Magdalene first, and then the disciples, and then other people, um, mostly disciples, um, see him. He appears to them. Um, he speaks to them, uh, they hear his voice, um, he, uh, he appears in closed rooms, uh, manifests, and then vanishes again, I mean, is clearly not a regular physical body. I mean, it, it, the descriptions in the New Testament uh, of the appearances of Jesus uh, suggest that this was not a, a regular physical body. It wasn't um, even somebody pretending to be Jesus walking into the room and walking out. The door was locked and he can appear and disappear. So now these look very much like after death contacts. And so uh, the normal approach to these resurrection appearances of Jesus, which go on for 40 days within a fairly small radius of Jerusalem, um, the normal uh, approach is this is a complete unprecedented miracle that defies all normal human thought and utter, utterly incredible to anyone who doesn't believe this on uh, at faith and believing it because it's impossible being in a sort of triumph of faith and over uh, reason or, and all that kind of thing. So it's normally treated as utterly mirac miraculous and unique. But if it's seen in the context of us death contacts, it becomes not particularly miraculous and not particularly unique. In fact, uh, after-death contacts are common. I mean, millions of people have experienced them who are alive today, uh, whose, whose loved ones have died. Um, so uh, 
if one sees the resurrection appearances of Jesus as after death context, then they become very credible. There's no need for some extreme leap of faith. Um, um, and you could say that this would, uh, I, I dare say some conservative Christians would resist this interpretation because they want it to be unique and miraculous. And this makes it not exactly commonplace, but not something that's totally outside the normal order of things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I very much like that approach, in fact. And I, I mean, one thing that has always struck me is that Jesus's resurrection is not the only resurrection, even in the New Testament. There are three other accounts of resurrections in the gospel stories themselves. There's Jairus's daughter, there's Lazarus being raised from the dead. Um, and so the significance for me is not that it happened, but it's the meaning of why it happened. And, um, and, and part of that is to inquire into the nature of the appearance of Jesus, because as you say, sometimes it seems very physical and at other times um, not at all, either coming through walls or, of course, when Jesus appears to the disciples, but they don't recognize who he is. And that whole domain is much more interesting, it seems to me, than the sort of the bright lights of a blunt miracle. Um, and in fact, um, this in this book, uh, Leslie King's book, Surviving Death, she only very briefly at the end, but she says that perhaps one of the ways forward here is not to treat these accounts as kind of isolated sort of data points, a very reductive approach, um, as if you're sort of trying to prove something yes or no, but instead to feed them into a much wider um, picture of life and death as well. Um, and so see them as building up um, uh, a much larger account of, you know, the nature of things. Um, one of the ways that this might happen is that um, if you have other experiences that are outside of a regular materialist conception, um, then you have much better ways of accounting for what are otherwise thought to be anomalous. Um, they're not actually anomalous at all, but they are just speaking to the wider perception of life than normally is operative in the secular world. Um, and in fact, a, a New Testament scholar who I really like has picked up on this in relation to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, he's called Dale Allison. He's a professor of the New Testament at Princeton University. And he wrote a very long book considering um, not just the accounts in the Gospels, but also the reception history of the resurrection of Jesus. And his, he comes to the conclusion that, um, as you say, um, appearances after death are actually commonplace. Um, but what he does is he draws on other traditions as well to fill out um, the account of what might have happened. Um, and in particular, he draws on the traditions that have noted that certainly amongst saints and sages, um, the very materiality of the body is often attested to become sort of more porous or less substantial. Um, probably the best known tradition is what's called the rainbow body in Tibetan Buddhism where there's accounts of people when they die um, disappearing in a sort of light, as if the materiality of their body had become some kind of spiritual presence or um, energy um, that was perceived as light. Um, and Dale Allison wonders whether that's a way of understanding the resurrection appearances of Jesus and why they have these different qualities um, at different times. Um, and I, I very much like that approach because it is trying to build a sort of panoptic view of these things um, rather than, as you say, invite people to make this kind of leap of faith that holds on to one ultimately, you know, in terms of the empirical evidence, unprovable event. And because it's so long ago, um, you know, it's why the discussion of the resurrection of Jesus just goes on and on ad infinitum. Um, and so actually, if you do take that reductive approach to the resurrection as if it's the kind of crucial proof point of Christianity, you actually make Christianity much more fragile, it seems to me, um, because it it sort of stands or falls on what you decide, um, you know, when, but when treated as this isolated incident is ultimately undecidable. Um, but rather, if you see it in a much broader context, then it, it relates to your experience in the here and now. As, as well as, you know, what might have happened back then. 
Um, and so beds it down in a much broader experience of life. And I guess that's why, you know, coming back to terminal lucidity and other um, sorts of um, after death contact, that's why these things do connect up in people's minds and become, uh, well, not just consoling in the sense of grieving and mourning, but um, consoling in the sense of expanding people's perceptions of life. Um, because, you know, death is a transition. It is um uh, a challenge it, it isn't easy you know much as presumably our birth was a transition and and wasn't easy there's, there's elements of of pain and difficulty and uncertainty even trauma involved um but having a wider context within which that might be held and so stepped into embraced it, it feels to me is much much more important than some rather narrow sort of proof point as if life can be rescued um, if you can show that something 2,000 years ago happened for certain. Quite agree, um, Mark. And, and uh, I think that this, these studies on the natural history of dying and death um, are really helpful. Um, and I think actually comparing it across cultures is very helpful too. Because in many cultures, there's a belief that after death, people are still around for a while. 40 days is actually quite a, a common period, and like in, in Jesus's resurrection appearances. In India, for example, uh, among Hindus, there is a series of ceremonies after death to help the soul pass on. And in South India, where I lived for a while, for years actually, um, there's one practice, I think it's at 40 days, when they put out a bowl of rice near the house of the person who died. Um, and if the crows and other birds come and eat it, it means the person's moved on. Um, if they don't, it's because the person's still there, they're still present, they still want food and still are attracted to food and, and the birds don't come near. And so they have a kind of empirical test to see whether people have moved. And if they haven't, then they do ceremonies to help them move on. Um, so the idea that there's a period after death when people are still more present than um, and I suppose when, in, I mean, in the Christian tradition, there are funerals and then a requiem mass, which would, could be seen as a kind of a, a later stage, often weeks after death, um, would be a way of this next step of moving on as the next stage. So I think there's the suppression of these discussions in a kind of secular materialist world has left a lot of people very unprepared. Um, but I think when we look at the natural history and also these cultural patterns that, because after all, all cultures have had to deal with death. It's a feature of every single human culture dealing with death and what it means and how the process takes place. Um, I think this will not just be of academic interest. I think it will be of practical importance in the dying process. And of course, since my years are advancing, I've got more personal interest in this than I used to have. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it greatly engages me as well, partly because of having experienced um, the death of my mother when she was relatively young. And it's also something which I took from my work on Dante's Divine Comedy, that part of Dante's message is that the purpose of this life, at least in large part, is to become capable of what might follow. Um, that we kind of we can use this life to prepare um, a more expansive perception of life in all its fullness, to use Jesus's expression. And because our capacity to engage with life is very much to do with our virtues, the qualities of our personality, our habits, um, you know, as is often remarked these days. And what you see of life very much depends upon what you take to the act of perception. And so developing a capacity for openness and discernment um, in the here and now is good, but um, I've been convinced by uh, Dante and the Divine Comedy particularly that it's going to be really valuable in terms of what happens next as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, not just the business of dying, but the business of living is caught up in this as well um, and not closing that down. This is all very fascinating. Uh, you know, thanks very much indeed. Well, thank you, Mark. We'll have to leave it there for now, um, but I, we may return to this at some stage in the future.